please join me in welcoming Sonia Johnson. This is vagina power. It's, ama <laughs> it's amazing how many people know that. You just see that everywhere you go. <laughs> I'm going to begin by telling you a dream that a woman told me. She was a woman from Missouri. She told me she dreamed one night that she was standing on top of a tall building, looking out in every direction. As far as she could see, all she could see were more concrete and glass, steel buildings, and she felt very alienated by that because she was a country woman. She wanted to go home. She was homesick. And a, a voice inside her said, well, that's easy. If you want to go home, all you've got to do is go and step off the edge of this building. So she walked over the edge of the building, and she looked down. And way down, there was a little miniature street with little miniature cars. And she said, hey, this is ridiculous. You know, if I step off here, I'll kill myself. And the voice inside her said, well, take it or leave it. It's the only way to get home. And as she thought that over, the thought of never seeing the fields and the grass and the trees of home again, the grief of that so outweighed her fear of death that she walked over to the edge of the building and she stepped off. And as she started to fall, a big rope appeared in front of her. This is a dream, remember? And she grabbed a hold of the rope and she swung way out to the end of its arc. And when she got way out there, she realized, if you want to go home, all you've got to do is go and step off the edge of this building that building where she'd just been and she wouldn't be any closer home. Little miniature street with those little miniature cars. She let go again. As she started to fall, another big rope appeared in front of her. She grabbed hold of that, swung out the end of its arc, let go again, grabbed a hold again, let go again, all the way home. When she woke up, she said she knew immediately what that dream meant. She said she knew that it was her wise old woman inside telling her how women are leading the species home. That was a hard thing for her to, to take in, to believe, to have any feeling for. And it's hard for all women to believe that it's possible that that's what we're about, that it's possible that we are central to anything. Well, and the reason, of course, is easy. We've been slaves. We have been the slaves on this planet in every group, every, every country, every tribe, every nation, every class for the last 5,000 years. And slaves. Uh, part of being a slave is feeling as if nothing you're doing isn't central or important or could possibly mean anything, could possibly, certainly couldn't mean anything about the evolution of the species, for heaven's sake. Forget that. And also, that, that feeling of worthlessness and, um, and uh, peripheralness is emphasized and reinforced all day long by the trumpets of patriarchy that are blaring in our ears and telling us that the women's movement is about issues. Women's issues. <laughs> you know, you have to squinch your mouth up into a little tiny zoom to say women's issues. <laughs> and, and then it's about women's rights and women's issues. And you know, that, isn't ex <laughs> that wasn't exactly how we felt. And f but we believed those voices for so long that, w that our, our feeling of the immenseness of this, as we listen to them, kind of collapses down to, and we say, oh yes, we've got to get busy on these issues of ours, haven't we? <laughs> and it's only when we get together like this, or we're with our friends, or alone someplace, and have some clarity that we remember what the women's movement really is all about. And we realize that it has nothing whatever to do with issues. <laughs> that it isn't about women's rights. That the women's movement is the greatest spiritual revolution in the history of the world. There's never been anything. And you know when I say spiritual, I don't mean religious. You know, I just wanted to make sure you knew that. <laughs> I don't think religion and spirituality can exist in the same place at the same time. <laughs> Nothing remotely like this awakening. Nothing remotely like the women's movement has ever been on this planet before, as far as we know, ever in human history. Half the human race is rising. Half the human race. Rising out of the deepest coma, such a slumber, of an anesthetization, a, a hypnotic spell, rising finally after thousands and thousands of years. Finally, thank goodness, to save our own lives, we're rising everywhere 
to save our own lives and in saving our lives to save all life on the planet. We know that feminism that undergirds this, this great tra global transformation of the human species, we know that feminism hasn't anything to do with issues. That feminism is a way of being in the world. It's a way of seeing everything. It's a worldview. In fact, it is a philosophy of such genius, such incredible brilliance, that if some man had thought of it, we would all be deslavering all over his boot tips. So he, would, he, would be on the, he would be on the front of everything, you know, and on every talk show and everybody would just be saying, oh, this man is such a titan, oh, such a brilliant mind. Compared to him, Marx was nobody. But of course, because, because it's coming out of women's lives. Because what feminism is, is an articulation of the way women are in the world. It's an articulation of the way we view the world. It's an articulation of our value system. We have the only art alternative value system to patriarchy. We are the alternative. But, and it's coming out of each one of our lives. There isn't a female Marx on the planet right now, or equivalent thereof, out of whom is coming this theory. It's coming out of our daily lives as we begin to wake up as we begin to take our place in history, start to fulfill our destiny, because our destiny is, all women on this planet now, our destiny is to do this work, is to move this species and all life into some place that we have only dreamed of, longed for, that we can't even imagine, but we know that it's some place where finally there can be some love that there hasn't been any love on this planet for 5,000 years and we are all so hungry for it and that's where it's moving and we know that this is what feminism is about and that it couldn't have a female Marx, it couldn't just have a leader or several big leaders because then we wouldn't be moving into a new world that the new world is that it is coming out of all our lives that is incredibly important for every woman who has any consciousness at all to begin to transform her own life and that that's what it's all about. Well, as I think about transforming my own life and what that means about transforming the planet, and as I've thought about this for several years, because you know the only thing that's important to me, the really, what I'm focused on like a laser beam, is trying to change reality. And if, and if that's the case, and it is with me, what I have realized I had to do is figure out what reality is. <laughs> what is it? And, and where does it come from? And how do we, and who made it? And um, how, how mutable is it? In other words, the nature of reality. A simple question like that. Um, we realize that none of those guys quite, although they've, they've tussled with this for a long time, it was, it was, left to women to finally get a grip on it. So we've been trying to get a grip on this. And as I thought it over, because if we're going to change reality, we really have to know what it is. And I've been thinking, what is it? And I remembered how those people that have been tussling with it have been saying, well, you know, there isn't such a thing as objective reality out there. And I couldn't make any sense of that until across my desk came this book in which it was a story about Magellan and his men and how they sailed into the Tierra del Fuego Islands a few hundred years ago in their big sailing ships. You know what they look like. A big mass of sails glistening in the sun, billowing in the wind. ta -da! They came into the harbor and they put down their anchor and the men all crawled down over the sides of these ships in the little rowboats and rowed up to the shore. Well, some time later, the shaman called all the islanders together and she said, and that's the only place I changed the story because I figured they changed it first and I'm just changing it back again. So the shaman called the people together and she said, I'm going to tell you something preposterous, so get ready. She said, I've been thinking about how those men couldn't have come across all that water, all that open sea, in those little bitty boats that they rowed up to our shore in. And that means, and this is a preposterous part, that means that there have to be big, big boats out there in our harbor. Boy, everybody turned and looked out there and got goosebumps because all they could see was the blue, shimmering water. And they turned back at her, to her and said, really? <laughs> And she said, yeah, really. <laughs> now we can say, how is it that they couldn't see those ships? 
Those ships were really there. They were real. They had to have been able to see those ships, but you know, they didn't. And it's because they weren't real to them, because reality is what we expect to see in that harbor. Reality is what we think is going to be there when we look. Reality is what we think is inevitable. Reality is what we think God put down out there, and now we just got to cope with it the best we can. <laughs> God, uh, reality is what we think is very strong and very powerful and very important. Reality is what we value. Reality is what we pay attention to all the time. And if that's true, that means that all reality is in here, that this is where it lives. And if that's true, it means that all systems are internal systems. And that means patriarchy lives in here, that this is where it lives. And that every morning we have to, to, to keep it real, to make it so that we can keep seeing it out there in the harbor. Every morning when we wake up, we have to project it again out onto our external canvas because that's what we do with what we think is real. We project it out there. We have to project patriarchy, all these institutions, all these yucky ways out there every morning when we wake up. And then we have to start inter keep we have to every morning begin interacting with them again as if they were real. We have to keep it going with our participation in believing in it, in, in participating to make it real, to uh, institutionalize it, to make it what we call objective all the time. And if that's true, it means that the minute patriarchy ceases to exist in here, the minute we stop projecting our belief in it, our belief that it's very strong, the men are very powerful, we've got to deal with this, and th because this is, this, this is the way things are, the minute we stop doing that and stop interacting with it in a way to make it real out there, the minute patriarchy stops existing in here, it will stop existing everywhere. I went to something called well, that, what that means is, of course, that the only genuine revolution possible, the only revolution that really is a revolution, that really changes anything, is an internal revolution. That this is where the most radical action in the world can take place. And that when people say, oh, you've dropped out now, haven't you, Sonia? I said, no, finally, I've dropped in. Now I am doing the real, really radical action of my life. Well, I was at something called the Wise Women's Council a few years ago in Houston in the summer. And all the famous feminists were there. And oh, I thought, what a wonderful opportunity. Here are the women whose books I'd read when I first came into the movement. Here were the women who'd since become friends and whose minds I really admired and respected. And we had a lot of free time after our official meetings, and just kind of lying around trying to keep cool in Houston summer and talking. And so I thought, and I was writing this book that I've got over here, and I was thinking about all these ideas. And they were so, they were so, um, what, not clear, to say the least. And so, <laughs> so I thought, I'll just try them out. Because one of the ways I get things clear is to say them. You know, you do this too, I trust. And so I, I thought, here's a perfect audience. So I started telling these women how I was going to begin to detach my belief from patriarchy. I was going to begin, I was going to stop projecting it out there every morning. I was going to stop coming to the war every morning, ready again, you know. Because you know that phrase that said, that slogan that says, if, what if they threw a war and nobody came? I was going to stop coming. Be and um, I told them about something a good friend of mine had said, who just happens to be in the audience tonight. Isn't that wonderful? I give this speech everywhere. And tonight, Sheila um, Figer is in the audience. And she'd said to me some time before, you know, Sonia, I've done all the things that, oh, she said, I've been a member of NOW now for 14 years. And I've been uh, president of New York State now for a couple of terms. I've done all the things they told me were going to change the system. I've voted and I've organized voters and I've lobbied and organized lobbyists and I've campaigned and organized campaigns and I've walked districts and precincts and gone door to door and I've done media and I've, I've marched and demonstrated and done civil disobedience. And I'm not going to do any of that anymore because it's not going to change anything. And I said to those wise women there, I'm not going to do any more of that either. And one of them said, oh, Sonia. You know, they're always saying to me, oh, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not practical, she said. And I thought, practical. 
Isn't that an interesting word, practical? I thought about how for 5,000 years women have been resisting patriarchy in every way that we could think of doing it. And you know, if we want to know what women were like all those thousands of years back there, all we got to do is look in the mirror or write at the woman next to us. This is how women always have been. This is how women always were, like us, always brilliant, always strong, always magnificent, always courageous, and always knew on some level, if not consciously, always, all women have known that the men's system is inimical to everything we love, is deadly to life. We have tried in every way we knew to get them to stop doing this, in all the covert, over, political, private, public ways that there are, and we have been very creative and ingenious people always, so we found hundreds and hundreds of ways to resist this system, to try to change those guys, to get them to understand, to get them to stop it. 5,000 years of resistance, you know, I don't want to be hasty, but it seems to me... <laughs> But it seems to me that 5,000 years is long enough to try something <laughs> that doesn't work. And women want to be fair, and I think we've given it a fair trial. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> and so I said to these women, I thought that I was beginning to figure out that what we resist persists. That in fact, men didn't just get worse and worse and worse all by themselves, but that somehow women were involved in that in some way. And um, I said, for instance, look out. I mean, I look out at this system, and this system is everywhere. The schools, the churches, the grocery stores, the buildings, the streets, the cars. I look out there and see nothing that I would have done this way. Not <laughs> one single thing. Nothing, nothing. I don't see anything. I would have done this way at all. I see, so I can't see one place where I am reflected. None of this reflects me. None of this reflects what I love. None of it reflects what I value. None of it reflects what I am, how I am in the world. It is so alien. It might have dropped off of some other planet, or I might have. It's just. It's not my stuff at all. And what I see also is patriarchy at its, when I look out there, I see patriarchy in its decadence. It is now so ripe that it's almost, I mean, it's just rotten. I mean, it's, <laughs> it is so now fully itself. It is completely putrescently <laughs> patriarchal. How did it get this way? How did it get to its very nadir or the pinnacle of its putridness or whatever <laughs> when we were working so hard to try to change it? And some women say, well, boy, think what would happened, where it would be if we hadn't. And I'm saying, I got a hunch it couldn't be a lot worse. I mean, <laughs> I think this is as bad as it can get without killing all of us at once. I mean, that's the next step. You know, that's the only way it can get more deadly than it is is to kill us all right away rather than slowly uh, and <laughs> so on, painfully. And... Um, <laughs> So I said to myself, it looks to me like that's some evidence that our resistance has been collaborative. And if that's true, why is it that what we resist seems to persist? Why is it that resistance is the most powerful, though, though subtle form of collaboration possible? And the minute I asked myself that question, into my mind popped this image, I think, in pictures, and came this picture of a great fortress on a hill, with its pennants flying, its big thick walls, its massive gate, patriarchy. And all the guys behind those big, those big walls and that gate all lined up there doing patriarchy, you know, mischief of some <laughs> kind. And down the hill, looking up at all that, all that uh, strength up there, all us women stand there, look up there, saying to one another, boy, how are we going to get them to stop this? We've got to get through to those guys. How are we going to get them to listen to us? How are we going to pay attention? We've got to get through to them. And some women are pole vaulting over the walls. They think if they can just get in there, you know. <coughs> they can change it. <coughs> and the rest of us down there with this great battering ram, you know. And think of the shape of a battering ram. There we are. <coughs> 
with this great battering ram, and we're just all lined up along it. And we are, I mean, hundreds of us, all through, all down through history, all the hundreds of years, uh, we have been doing this. Here we are with this battering ram, and we're backing up, and we're running up at that door and going, oh! like that and over and over again and at the wall home and we get worn out and we fall by the way and others the next generation rushes up grabs a battering ram and they do another section of the wall boom like that and over and over and over again we batter at the walls of patriarchy batter trying to get through it those guys now I could see as I looked at that picture in mind exactly what was happening behind those walls can't you just see it? There are those guys. Oh, wow, is there adrenaline running? We are spurring them on to such enormous creativity and inventiveness to defend their system. And not only that, every time we warm against one of those walls, they look to see if there's a weak place there. And so they are strengthening that little weak place in their system and in their theory and in their, um, <coughs> in their philosophy. We're helping them strengthen it. We're, and they are back there uh, inventing bionic metals. That door is so thick now, nothing can get through it. We just entrench them more. We just solidify their system. We just, in fact, have helped them get it very much together by bombarding them like that, by making them have to defend it all the time, and by showing them where the weaknesses are, by hitting against them. You know, I should have figured this out as a mother. I mean, can you, does this sound familiar to anybody in this room? <coughs> Uh huh. You know full well. I mean, we could have learned this in our own little patriarchal microcosms, couldn't we? If we had taken ourselves seriously as mothers, we all know that if you want to get your children, if you've got a child that's doing something you can't stand, that the, the, the absolutely most, the worst possible thing you can do is hit against that thing, nag them, talk about it, make it a, a big issue. Because what happens if you do? We can all see it in unison, right? It just gets worse, right? <laughs> I'm speaking as a mother of four teenagers. I mean, some of them are no longer teenagers, thank goodness. That, um, have having gone through that, and I, I don't know why I didn't figure out that principle at the time. But you know, better late than never. <laughs> well, so those women said to me, those wise women, they're lying on the floor, fanning themselves, said, all right, Sonia, what does that mean for you? I was afraid they'd ask. I said, um, well, I'll tell you what it means right now. I don't know everything it means, and I don't know if I'm going to know everything it means in my lifetime. I'm working on it. But right now it means I'm not going to work to get any more laws passed in this country. Nothing could make me do any more of that. Oh, you know, that was horrifying to them because they'd spent most of their lives, or at least most of their um, last 20 years of their lives in the women's movement, working on getting laws passed here, think of the ERA passed, all those things. There was a time I would have given my life to get the ERA passed, and now you couldn't get me to raise a finger. And that, oh, it was terrible for me to say that to them. And they said, well, why not? And I said, because I finally figured out something. I finally figured out that the men own the law. <laughs> Isn't, <laughs> I know you're amazed, aren't you? That it, <laughs> It is amazing. Um, I said, they own it. You see, they make them, they make those laws, they interpret the laws, and they enforce them. And they always do it to keep patriarchy going. I mean, it is set up. There are checks, and when they talk about checks and balances, they're not kidding. It is set up so that no matter what we do, it always keeps this. We know this is patriarchy, the power over sadomasochistic model on planet Earth, the war model, the, the win-lose, one-up. The, the model of oppression. Men on the top, women on the bottom, and every class, every race, every nation of the world, women kept there by incalculable violence and political terrorism. That there isn't any other way to keep adult, strong, brilliant, beautiful human beings on their faces in the dust, in the mud, except by such violence that it is unspeakable. And we know that that's the pattern, that's the model on planet Earth. And then I said to those women, everything, and, and that the law is a pillar of that. The law was set up to keep that. Religion is set up to keep that. This university is set up to keep that. The schools, you know, you name it, it's set up to make sure this goes on and on and on. And I said, then the law, the laws, no matter what we do, always come back to keeping this going. And I said, let me give you some examples. I mentioned to them about California women who have told me about the struggle that they went through, that you went through to get no-fault divorce, and how, and, and how you would do anything to get rid of that, because guess what? Because the men owned that law, they, owned, they passed it, now they own it, and what they did do now is use it against the women. And I said, in, all over the country, 
where women have spent hours, I mean hundreds of hours, lobbying men to pass child support laws so they could get some financial help from the erstwhiles out there to take care of this brood. And if er, almost every place I've been where women have got those laws passed, what's happening now? Guess what? Are men paying any more child support than they ever did? No. Guess who's paying child support? Us. The women. That's what's happening out there because the men own it. They can use it the way they want it and they always want to make sure that they don't allow us to rise, that they don't allow us to use their system to get ahead. And I said the same thing happens with, um, the same thing has happened with custody laws. Women got custody laws passed so we could try to get custody of our children and now men are using them to get custody of the children. I said, I'm not going to hand the men a knife to stab me in the back anymore. I'm not going to be accomplice in my own oppression one more second. And that was unbearable to these women and they were thinking, I could see their minds, some of them just turning that. They've got to find a hole in this and I said, I hope you do. Because it's that, you know, what I want and what I want more than anything is just to figure out how to change the world tomorrow, that's all. And if you've got a better idea, boy, I want it right now. And so one of them said, I think I got it, Sonia. I can see the faults in your thinking, and they're demonstrated by the, uh, by the example of when we were able to go through the men's system to get free. And I said, when was that? And she said, well, it's Roe versus Wade. And I said, oh, shoot. I was hoping you were going to tell me something that didn't prove my point, but let me tell you what I think about Roe versus Wade. And then I told her about how she remembered at the beginning of this women's, the second half of the women's movement in this century, oh, there was such excitement. I wasn't there then, but I talked to a lot of you who were. How many of you were? Back there, at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, were feminists actively in the movement. Oh, wow, such a time, huh? Everything that's written about that, all women who were there, that was the golden age of feminism. Such nostalgia for those times. And I'm saying, I wonder what happened. You know, there was such enthusiasm, such fervor, such buoyancy, such hope. There was just never any other time like it. And you were calling yourselves the women's liberation movement. And you, there was an understanding in this movement, on this, on this continent at least, that has since kind of disappeared. Doesn't mean individual feminists don't have this understanding, but it doesn't seem to undergird the whole kind of group experience anymore. And that understanding that was is everywhere when you look back there and talk to women who were there was or is that women are men's colonized lands. That we are colonized people. And just like the British went into Nigeria and took over that country because, of course, obviously those people were inferior. I mean, they look how they look. They didn't look like God. Look, God is white and, and delights them and looks like Englishmen. And clearly these people, how could they rule a country looking the way they did? Non-God-like. Um, and so, good for you, the Englishman said, here we are to save you from trying to do something you can't do, which is rule your own land. So we're going to do it for you. Boy, aren't you lucky. And so they took them over and they owned their country and they owned their bodies and they made laws and governing these people who had owned that land, whose forebears had been on that land for maybe millions of years, how to forever, no longer had any say about their own lives. If they broke laws in, on their own land, they were thrown in jail, imprisoned, killed. And they began to be colonized also in their heads because they began to hear the trumpets of patriarchy again blaring at them, the trumpets of oppression saying, you're stupid, you're, you're incompetent, we're better, um, you're meant to be slaves. They began to have the slave mentality. Their revolution was that they rose out of that, and then when they did, um, the colonists had to go home. But that women at that time, the beginning of the, as I say, the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, understood that women are men's colonized lands. That thousands of years ago, men began to own women's bodies and began to use women's bodies as their resources, began to mine us. Emotionally, we began to give men our support. We began to give men all we had. We gave them our children. We gave them our work. We gave them our labor. We didn't make them pay for it. We gave them our love. We gave them our attention. We gave them all our resources. 
And they didn't just colonize our lands, which meant that we could no longer, we were no longer involved in the decision making about our own bodies, our own countries that housed our spirits in which, in which we had lived, um, in which we lived. They also recolonized our minds, just the way they did that the colonists do. It is a, it's a double uh, whammy, you might say, because of course the mind and the body are not separate as um, we have been uh, preposterously led to believe. Um, <laughs> and then in fact, women are the economic base of patriarchy. It's our work, our labor, our, our uh, resources that give men the wherewithal to run this world. It's based on slave labor. Women are the own. We're the colonized. So women, so central to that first part of the women's movement, or that early part of the women's movement, central to that was the women's health movement. Because what was happening there was for the first time in our lives, we were saying howdy to our own cervixes. I mean, we were looking eye to eye with our cervixes. We might have been the 17th pair of eyes to look at them. Another 16th may have been male. But finally, we were looking right at them and realizing Something that sounds funny to say, but really is quite revolutionary. We were realizing that you didn't need men's male eyes to see female cervixes, or female vaginas, or female uteruses. And you didn't need to be trained by the male AMA, AMA as a butcher to be able to tell what needed to be done if there was something wrong, how to keep it healthy. We were beginning to understand that we could rule our own land that we could do whatever it was that needed to be done for our countries. Just the way the Nigerians began to say, hey, you know, what made us think we couldn't do this? We'd done it forever before they came along. We were doing great. And they began to deprogram themselves of their colonized mind. They began to understand that they could do it. We were beginning to understand we could do it. We were doing menstrual extraction. Women were becoming midwives all over the place. We were beginning to talk about safe, effective, cheap, natural birth control measures we could do ourselves. We were beginning to talk about maybe we could even control conception without, I mean, with our, with our mind and will connected with the body. We're beginning to really move into self-rule. That means, of course, that we were breaking this contract because slavery is always a contract. And I don't mean to say that it's a contract that we keep consciously or that there isn't good reason why we have decided to keep that contract. This is not a blame the victim night, you know. This is, this it always is a contract. And when we began to do those things, when we began to say, in effect, without maybe even saying it, men, men don't own this. We can do what we wish with it. We can do it ourselves. We can do it better ourselves. When we began saying that and feeling that way, what we were doing was breaking the contract that said, we will always look to the men to do it for us. We will always ask your permission. We will always acknowledge you as our owners that you have a right to make laws about our bodies, our lands, that you have a right to colonize us. We will always do that. You can count on us. That's the contract. We were breaking that. That means that we were walking out of patriarchy. And you know, when the slaves leave, you can't have any masters. It takes two to have slavery. It takes two to have patriarchy. If there aren't any slaves, there can't be any masters and the slaves. We're moving out into a new world. We're just living in a new place. Well, if you don't think, that the men who control this country didn't know that and didn't feel in their very viscera incredibly endangered, then you don't understand patriarchy. Because the men may not be smart out there, but they are incredibly crafty. When it comes to <laughs> self-preservation, they are wily indeed. And they knew that if women take back our bodies, if we take back rule of our lands, if we begin to rule ourselves, patriarchy is over. And I don't know how consciously men oppress us. You know, it's, we always say, um, I mean, the women who are still uh, terribly distressed about, um, who can't face the unbearable thing that men hate us who still want to think that men really wish the best for us, think, well, they don't mean to do this. They're just caught in it, too. And maybe that's true, and I don't know what the truth of that is, and it's irrelevant to me. But I would be willing to bet my life 
I would be willing to bet anything. I practically know it. It's one of those things I just intuit madly. <laughs> that when that began to happen, those men were fully conscious. And they met and had meetings. And they had many long into the night meetings about this. Because we were at the place where we could have ended it all. And so what they did was think of a plan. They thought of a strategy in this war against women. You can use strategy when we talk about men's ideas about what they need to do, because it's war. They thought of a strategy, and they sent an emissary out after us. And he came running after us as we were walking off the New World. And he was saying, hey, you, hey, girls, uh, whim, lay, um, you know, I don't know what they call it. Uh, finally settled for girls. Hey, girls, hey, just a minute, wait up. You don't, hey, wait, you don't need to do this. I mean, you don't need to learn to do abortions and learn to take care of your own bodies. You don't need to learn to bring your own, I mean, women bringing their own babies. I mean, this is, I mean, why should you learn to do all that? We already know how. And you know, if you spend all your time and energy learning to do that and doing that, you won't have time left for your other issues. <laughs> and you know, we love you a lot, they said. And we care about your movement. We want you to have what you need. So you know, so you won't have to spend all your time working on one little issue, reducing freedom to an issue an issue, as tiny as you can get, issue. <laughs> so you won't have, so you'll have time to do all your other little bitty issues. We'll, you know what we'll do? Because of our love for you, because our caring about your being free, we'll let you have legalized abortion. Well, you know, if you can let somebody, you own them. So they let us. So we, can, we, know, we were out there, and we hadn't spent, you know, it, we hadn't had very many years of listening to our own voices. We were just beginning to be able to hear them across all those ages, all that ages of exile, those little tiny exiled voices starting to be able to be heard. They were so easily drowned out by our conditioning, our profound programming to believe that the men really mean the best for us and that we can really get the masters to set us free and that there's such a thing as being able to get somebody to free you. I mean, you can't be free unless you do it yourself. That's the definition of it. But you know, we had just hadn't had enough time. They caught us in the nick of time before we had really got a hold of our own wise women's voices. And so there we stood kind of milling around and we said, hey, you know, I think this is a victory. Is this a victory? Yeah, I think this is, this is a victory. Wow, right on. And so we came running back into this, right into the trap. And for the next 15 years, what we've been doing is all over this country, millions of women have spent millions of hours and millions of dollars in many, many states on their knees begging men to keep just a little semblance, just a little teeny piece of that allowance they promised us for abortions for poor women. Begging and pleading for just a little tiny, just to be a little kinder. Whereas if we had spent half that money, half that time, learning how to rule our own countries, learning how to get out of our colonized minds, learning self-government, we would now have a woman on every block who could do everything, tell us, teach us everything we need to know about our bodies. We would now be in full control of our bodies. We would be at the place in history where it wouldn't matter, in the history of this country, where it wouldn't matter. Those men could be spewing laws about our bodies out of every legal orifice. <laughs> They could be threatening us on all sides with this, that, and the other thing and telling us that we couldn't have abortions, we couldn't have birth control, we couldn't do this. It simply would be irrelevant because we would be already in possession of the land. But someday we're going to have to do that. Someday we're going to have to rule our own countries. Someday we're going to have to really, really understand that the slave masters cannot free the slaves even if they wished. That freedom comes from inside. It is, a, it is a state of being. It's a way of feeling about oneself. 
And the way it, the feeling is that we don't have to go through anybody else to get what we need. That we don't have to have, be relational all the time. That we don't have to have anybody else's approval. That we don't have to beg anybody. That, that we can do it ourselves. Whatever it is that we need, we can get it ourselves. That's the non-slave mind. Well, these women said to me, asked me some questions that I couldn't answer then. I had to go home and think about them. And even when I wrote that book, I didn't have them as clear as I'm getting them. And I hope that the next book is clear. It's, it's already being written. Because once you get started, oh, wow, it's addictive to write your stuff, you know. <laughs> it feels so good. And writing is thinking. And thinking feels wonderful. And thinking and feeling. Anyway, they said to me, they asked me these questions. They said, OK, Sonia, what? Explain to us two things. Explain the dynamics of why what we resist persists. And what then, if we don't do that, what would you advise us to do? <laughs> Aye, there's the rub. Well, so I went home and I started thinking about both of these things. I'm looking in my life, looking in your lives, thinking about it hard. And I began to remember one of the most <coughs> most important nights of my life, where I was at some feminist meeting. This wasn't the meeting in the, uh, the Mormon church. I mean, you can tell already. I said feminist meeting. Some group of feminists were meeting, and some feminist was giving the speech. And she's uh, being the voice for us all, which is what I feel like I am doing here. I want you to know that I know that if I should suddenly drop dead or have to go to the bathroom or something, <laughs> that um, or be overwhelmed with hot flashes and have to go and take my clothes off in some other room, um, that any one of you could come down and give this speech. I want you to know that I know that, as I say all these things, I know this already about us, and that I feel enormously privileged <laughs> that it's an honor to be able to be the, sp the voice of us, and that I, I am thankful for this chance to do it. I got thinking about that night that I just sat in this meeting where this woman said the thing that began to change everything. It's a, it's a, it's, was a, it was the thing that made me cry. You remember when you first heard the thing that just made you just burst into tears, the first feminist words that made you say, oh my gosh, I'm not stupid after all. I'm not crazy after all. There are others like me. There is a whole world like me out there. This is my tribe. You remember, this is when this happened to me. This woman said, she was giving the speech and said, the means are the ends. That's a basic feminist principle, that how we do it is what we get. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. That explains why I have always felt so stupid in patriarchy. I thought about how I had been in all those seminars. I went to, clear through graduate school, got the doctorate and all that stuff, and felt stupid every single second. <laughs> I kept thinking, boy, if I just get one more degree, I won't feel stupid. Well, you know, it didn't work, did it? And I'd be sitting in those English seminars, and oh, the English departments are so stuffy. Do you know that? <laughs> oh. They take themselves so seriously. They are so smart, you know. <laughs> And there they are in their tweed jackets with their leather elbows, pulling on their pipes, talking about very important and brilliant things. And, and as they talk and talk, they would come to a place, as some guy was expounding his incredibly brilliant theory, that I would suddenly not get it. And so I would, at first I would say, say, hey, just a minute, will you explain to me again? I didn't see the connection there. And then all heads would turn. <laughs> And they would look at each other like, oh, why did we ever even allow them to learn to read? <laughs> well, you know, you only have to get, do that once or twice till you, you don't do it anymore. So we'd get to that place where I didn't get it, and then like everybody else in the room, I would say, hmm, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> just faked it, just faked it all the way through. I never got it, not once, but I got to that place, never got it. And I think we, and I'd get to the place, finally, I didn't even realize I was faking it anymore. But on some level, I knew I wasn't getting it, and I really felt stupid. Well, I think that's the case with all women, and why, what I think is, or what I know is, the reason we didn't get it is because it wasn't gettable. <laughs> we couldn't get stuck. We 
because this is the patriarchal mind. Let me just give you the best example I can give. All day long we hear this. If you've been anywhere today, you have heard this, this kind of reasoning <coughs> all around you. Every day I hear another example. I think, wow, there it is again, there it is again. Well, because patriarchy has a means to ends mind model, you know? If we want this, then we just, here we're going to think of ways to get it. Dump, 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 dump. Cause and effect mind. And what they say, for instance, a good, the best example I know of for that is, the men say, we want peace. And so what we're going to do to get that is, we're going to bomb and bomb and bomb and massacre and eviscerate and rape and pillage and lay waste and then. There is this little magic moment of alchemy where suddenly, voila, peace appears. And I would say, hey, now run that by me again. And I didn't get what happened. Be <laughs> I didn't get what happened between rape and peace. You know, there was something in there I missed. Well, the reason, of course, that I missed it was because there, there is just everything between rape and peace. I mean, they never come together at all because what we know, and women have intuited always, and what we now know consciously, is that there's only one way to have peace, and that's to be peaceful right now, this minute. This is the time to be peaceful. Now, if you want peace, be peaceful. That's how you get it. <laughs> We've known that. And that there isn't any getting to peace from war, 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 war. All you can get is more war from war because the means are the ends. There's no separation between means and ends. How we do it is what we get. If we do violence, if we do fighting, what we get is more fighting. Okay, I said to myself as I was thinking this all over, trying to write this book. So this feminist said that. So does that mean it's true? Have you ever heard feminists say things that you didn't think were true? Yeah, I have. Yeah, well, maybe this is one of them. Maybe you'd better figure out why, if true, why is that true? So I thought and thought about, okay, because I wanted it to be true because it feels so good. I explained why I wasn't stupid. You see, otherwise I'm stupid, so I have great stock, <laughs> great stake in figuring out why that isn't true. And when you have a great stake, boy, all your powers get focused. And I figured, I remembered as I was thinking about this, how atomic theory, which is changing the whole way we view everything, and which I think wasn't possible really until the women's movement began to make, loosen up the global mind, till the women's mind began to predominate, um, is teaching us that, has, has taught us, that this is an atomic universe that we're in. And that we're atomic people, that all, everything is atoms, that we are just dancing atoms. And in this atomic universe, the way atoms function is that there is no linear time. Time does not go like a river, to dum to dum to dum to dum Time simply is. And that all the time there ever was, ever will be, ever has been, is right now. That we're sitting in it. This is all there is is infinite. There's, there's plenty of it. And it is also a split second. It is all that at once. But that we are in time as a fish is in the ocean. We are just in it and that it is all right now. It is all at once. That there isn't time over there going to come sometime. The future isn't down the road someplace and the past isn't way back there someplace which is one of the reasons that therapists, some therapists now are saying you can change your past. Well, the reason is that it isn't out there, friends. You've got it right here. And we all, all know that the, that the past is also in the body, which is always in the present. So all time is now. That's what it means when they say all time is now. It really is now. This is all the time there is. The past and the present and the future are all here together because this is all there is. And what the, uh, several things that that means, if all time is right now, it means that the only time that we have any power is right now because this is the only time is that we're alive. This very moment as we sit here is the only time we're alive. This is it. And the wonderful thing about the body is that it, it anchors us to the present moment. 
And because the spirit is all through the body, we can rely on the body to tell us the truth. Because it never projects itself out into the... The body doesn't project itself out into the future, back into the past. The body is right now fully in our power. I mean, we are in our power, in our body right now, and only right now. And the body is so good about keeping us there. Anyway, so if we want whatever we want, we have to begin right now to have it, because this is all the time there is. That's one of the messages of that. But the other message is this, that if the present and the past and the future are all together right here, if the future is right here with the present, then it means that we can predict the future. I mean, the future isn't down there someplace, and there's no cause and effect, linear time, to tum tum Then it means that we can predict the future by how we are being in the present, by what we're doing in the present, that if this is all the time, then what we are doing right now is the future, that the future is in the belly of the present, that it is being born, is coming through our loins in the present moment, because this is all there is. And if that's true, and I think it is, what that means is that what we are doing right now is what we'll be doing in the future. That's why the means are the ends. That's why what we, how we do it, what we are doing is what we get, is because the future isn't separate from the present. That means that if we want peace down the road someplace, there isn't any down the road someplace. It is just now. That's why if you want peace, we have to be peaceful now. It's because there isn't any future. There is all time at once. That means so when women say, okay, what shall we do? What I say is, do right now what you wanted to be doing in the new world. Right now. If we want a new world, and I don't think there's anything else worth even thinking about. I mean, I'm through thinking about the old one. It is so boring. <laughs> If we want a world in which women are not afraid and patriarchy can't sustain women's not being afraid, it is based on our fear. Our fear is absolutely essential to it. We must be afraid in order for men to rule us. And if we want a world in which men can't rule us, we want a world in which women are not afraid, then we have to be unafraid right now. We can't wait until something happens out there to make us unafraid because you can't get to fearlessness from being afraid, being afraid, being afraid, being afraid, being afraid, and one day, magically, be unafraid. There's only one way not to have fear, and that's not to have fear right now. If we want a world in which women don't sacrifice our present happiness, for somebody else's happiness down the line somewhere. And you know there's a lot of that in the women's movement. When I first came into the movement, I remember women standing where I'm standing and saying things like, you know, we're doing rallies for the ERA and saying, boy, I know you're all tired out there. I know you've just been doing such wonderful work and you're all getting burned out. And, and it's just exhausting. And we know, I know, and I know you know that we're not going to see the results of this in our lifetime. But I'm willing to go on anyway. I'm willing to do this for my children, and I know you are. I'm not going to give up. You know I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. I'm going to do it for the generations following me, and I know you are too, right? And everybody's right, right? And I'm back there saying, yuck. <laughs> I thought we were going to do it right now, you know? And then I'm saying to my... <laughs> And then I say to myself, oh, now, Sonia, don't be so immature. You don't have to have instant gratification. That's a sign of immaturity. <laughs> All that stuff, you know, I would say to myself. But I should have listened, because that was the right response. Yuck. Because if we want a world in which women aren't sacrificing right now for somebody else down the line, then we've got to stop sacrificing right now. Because if we're sacrificing right now, we are making a future in which women sacrifice. There isn't any way to get to not being a sacrificial lamb from sacrificing, 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 sacrificing. There is no magic moment. All that comes from sacrificing is sacrifice. How we do it is what we get. 
The means are the ends. It's a basic women's understanding that we have to start applying to our own lives, our own what we're about. If we don't want a world in which women are on our knees begging men to be just a little kinder, please, guys, please. If we don't want a world in which women are on our knees being slaves, then we've got to get up off our knees right now. We can never do that again. Every time we do that, we make a world in which women do that. We make a world in which women grovel, in which women beg, in which women are slaves, in which women think that somebody else is going to free us. Somebody else has got the power, right? We don't have any power. We've got to get those that got the power to do it. Wrong. Who said they had power? They did. Doesn't that make you a bit suspicious? <laughs> I mean, thinking about that. I hear women talk about the men in power. We've got to get in there and get power. And I'm thinking, oh, there's something wrong with that. And I, I glommed on to the fact that men own the language. That they can call what, what they have anything. They could call it surely if they want it. <laughs> they called it power. And so we look out there and we see what they're doing, that incredible, vicious massacre of all life on the planet that they call power. We look out and say, well, if that's power, boy, I don't have any of that. I don't do that. So therefore, I'm powerless. Whoo, I said to myself, was well, that clever of those guys? I mean, as I say, they're crafty. Um, and I thought to myself, well, like, what is power? Power is obviously not controlled by massive and, and profound violence and humiliation and terrorism. That's not power. Power is the generative, creative, positive stuff of life. Power creates. Power is about making more, about abundance. Power is a power to create, not to destroy. What's the power to destroy? It's weakness. That's what it is. Weakness is what destroys. Character, logical weakness is destructive. And I look and I see then that what we've got are not men in power, but men in weakness out there. So I never say, I never reprogram myself by saying the men in power anymore. I always say, I reprogram myself by saying the men in weakness last week had Stupid Tuesday or something, I understand. <laughs> know that from having read the old papers. Somebody, I was being interviewed, and somebody told me they just had Stupid Tuesday. And I said, well, I don't read the old papers, and I don't listen to the old, so I don't know what's going on with the men in weakness anymore, because I say the women in power, the women in power are healing ourselves and one another. We're healing the whole planet, the women in power. Because women have that, and it's not power over, it's power to create, power to transform, power to make life and happiness and joy. That's what power is, and that's what we've always had, and that's why, as Mary Daly would say, the men turned it up, all their weakness power and our power, powerlessness. Why, we, why did we ever believe anything? I mean, I don't expect they ever opened their mouths, but what? They didn't tell us the truth. They lied, in fact. So... <laughs> So I can't remember where it was. So I'm going to take out my notes and see where that takes me. I don't know, my notes don't have it either. Um, so the question is, not what should we do? Because you see, we haven't seen women feel free for 5,000 years. And feelings are what matters because everybody operates all day long, every single thing we do comes out of our feelings. We can rationalize it with our heads and say, why I did that, but it comes out of how we feel about ourselves, how we perceive the world, feel about it, how we've internalized things. It's in here that the feelings come from, I mean, uh, that the behavior comes from. We have, because we haven't seen women feel free for 5,000 years, we haven't seen women behave like free people for 5,000 years. So we don't know what it will look like we haven't a clue. We can't just leap from here to there because there are no models for free women. How would we feel if we really believed that the men had no power to change 
anything. And in my book, I go into some depth about why they can't change it, even if they want it. Heaven knows they don't want, on the whole, to change it. But why they can't, why the people who are ruling, why the people who are in this position can never, can't change things. Why it always has to be the people on the bottom. Frederick Douglass said it, Sojourner Truth said it, Virginia Woolf said it in Three Guineas. It's always incumbent upon the slaves to rise and free ourselves. And in freeing ourselves, we free the oppressor. But until then, they are in, as in straight jackets in a little bitty jail cell. They ca why, why bother to ask them to do anything? They couldn't if they wished. We're outside the jail cell and free. And as I say, I do a long thing about that. But anyway, since they can't change it, it's because, for one thing, they have no power. Because patriarchy is at the end of its time. We are at the end of an epic. And the evidence of that is not just that I wish it were true, although I think that helps a lot. <laughs> and I think we should just go along assuming that it's true and stop projecting it as strong and mighty out there and keep giving it all its energy because all patriarchy is a massive vampire just <laughs> like that out of women's power all day long, out of our rich resources all day long. That's what is existing on. Vampires have no life of their own. It would drop dead if we got out of its reach where it couldn't suck us dry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that men have... That men have no power to change. Men can't change it. And the evidence that they're incredibly weak, that this system is at its end, is that there is violence everywhere. Violence is the last resort of weakness. And where we see every time we look anywhere, we see violence exploding everywhere, everywhere. It means that patriarchy is just nearly ready. It is so senile. It is hooked up. All I think has got plugs into every rich woman on the planet. I mean, by rich, I mean rich in our women's stuff that we got no words for. We got these plugs. That's their life support system. It's a little old withered up senile man that really wants to die. I mean, the kindest thing we can do you know, is pull the plug <laughs> out of our own cell. I think a good example of what would happen if we were to pull the plug. You know, enough of us just pull the plug. It takes lots and lots of plugs. And if we just, um, and just a critical mass of us pulled the plug, the guy would die and it would be over. And let me tell you what I think would happen. And what I think, how I think, well, the example of what we're up to. I think that all women on this patriarchal planet named planet Earth are battered women. And I think we are in a battering relationship with the patriarchal state. That he is our husband. And that this isn't an analogy, that it is exactly the same syndrome. And I think if we can look at and understand why one woman stays in a relationship with a battering man, and let's just say a battering man, although we know women do it to each other too, it's simpler if we don't get into that. Let's just say, because we learned it from the men, right? So let's just take it back to where we learned it. If we can understand, and we can now, because the women's movement has helped us understand why women stay in bad relationships. Intelligent women, brilliant women, courageous women. Why did they stay? Why did your mother stay? Why did my mother, why did you stay? Why did my mother stay? Who was so brilliant, so beautiful, so strong, such courage, such love. My father never laid a finger on her and demoralized her from morning till night for 65 years and is still at it as I speak. Why? When I was, I said to myself as I was growing up a little girl in that household and standing outside their relationship, you see, I could see that she had alternatives. I could see she didn't need to stay in there. She didn't need to take that. I could see all the things she might do. My mother was an educated woman. Even if she hadn't been there, there would have been alternatives. But I, and I thought she could see those alternatives. And so I was full of rage that she kept taking this when she didn't have to. I was so puzzled. I was so confused. Why? Why this woman whom I loved passionately, who was me, why was she doing this? Now, of course, I understand that battered women one of the characteristics of that 
syndrome is that battered women don't see the alternatives. She didn't see those alternatives. She didn't know she really had them. She might have seen them in her, with her head because she was smart, but she didn't feel the possibility of an alternative. She didn't feel free to do that. She hadn't done an internal revolution. She didn't know there was such a thing as an internal revolution. Well, this woman, let's take one battered woman. Let's name her Helen, because I know a battered woman named Helen. I'm going to tell you a story as I do this. In a marriage with Fred, who had been a smart woman and an, intel and an, and an educated woman. Battered, battered, 13 years. And one day, and thinking that this was, she had to deal with this guy. She had to try to get him to be a little kinder. She had to get into counseling. She had to change this guy. She had to change him. That was her only alternative, to change him. And so she was doing everything she could. She, she, and because, you see, she believed all the programming. She believed, and he, had just, he was just repeating the old, ancient programming to her. You're stupid. You're incompetent. You need me. I mean, you couldn't do it without me. You are so dumb. You're so disgusting. I mean, you're sexually uninteresting. I mean, you're, you're lucky I even stay with you. No other man would have. You may think that I'm bad, but my laws. Any man out there would treat you worse than this. I mean, you deserve worse than this. I'm really being kind. And, you know, if you even think of leaving, I'll kill you. And so on. That, that was her conditioning. This is our conditioning. Every single thing I said applies to the patriarchal state as well. Well, one day, Helen is in the emergency ward again. And the doctor, as he sets her shoulder, and as another doctor tries to put her eye back in its socket, and she's being treated for lacerations and bruises. The doctor who's seen her often in that room says, Helen, you know, I think that the next time I see you, you will just be passing through here on your way to the morgue. Now, why battered women change? It's different with every battered woman. I'm just telling you Helen's story because there are similarities in what, not maybe the story, but in what begins to happen inside. Helen said, I suddenly realized that, I, that though he had said he would kill me if I left, that the truth was he would kill me if I didn't leave, that I was going to die if I didn't get out of there, that it was just upside down and backwards. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and once I had begun to... That once I'd begun that program, de deprogramming, I began not to believe anything he'd said. I began not to believe that I was, it wasn't possible. But the most important thing is I began to care about my own life. When he said, you're going to be dead next time, I suddenly realized how much I wanted to be alive and how important it was for me to be alive and how important my life was. And I began to change how I felt about myself in that relationship. And when we change how we feel about ourselves in our relationships, everything outside us has to change to accommodate it. When we stop enabling men to do evil, they can no longer do it. Well, Helen began to move out of that relationship in her mind, began to see or to, to believe in the other alternatives began to believe that this wasn't the only possible way, that may, she, maybe she really could do it herself. And as she began to think those things, then other possibilities began to present themselves. She said, other women began to come into her life because she'd opened up to the possibility that there was something else out there. One day, Helen having done an internal revolution, you couldn't have told Helen back there before she had that experience in the hospital what to do. The question wasn't what to do. The question was, how shall I feel about myself? How do I want to feel in the new world? How, how shall I change my feelings so that my behavior then is a behavior of a free person? I don't have to figure out everything to do. That if I feel free, if I feel self-respecting, if I feel like an honorable person, I can, never, I can no more go to the polls to vote than fly to the moon. I don't have to decide not to vote. I can't do it if I love myself. If I have integrity, I can't do it. I don't have to make the decision. If I feel, if I feel, if I care about my own life, I can't stay somewhere where somebody's trying to kill me. I can't vote for the lesser of two evils. I can't vote for evil anymore and still be a whole person, an evil of any kind. I can't participate in anything that doesn't reflect my freedom, my integrity, my honor, my respect for myself. And so she does this internal revolution. And one day, she leaves the marriage and she divorces Fred. Now, what happens to that marriage? 
that Fred and Helen had over here. That oppressive, tyrannical regime of Fred's where he ruled her every movement, where he tyrannized her, terrorized her, and every once in a while to bond her to him was very kind and sweet to her, allowed her, let her do this, let her do that, and then made her think that she really could change him, but wedded him to her, her to him, him to her. Um, <laughs> Because every once in a while he would be kind. This is the Stockholm Syndrome. Remember, that happens to hostages, it happens to prisoners. They learn to love their, they learn to love their guards and their jailers because every once in a while those guards and jailers will do something really kind and because your life depends on it, you fall in love with them. I don't mean you love them, you fall in love. And that's well documented. We are the prisoners and the hostages. And men know how to do it. Every once in a while, Fred will do something really kind, a periodic reinforcement, whatever you know to call it. He does it, and whoom, and she's hooked in there. So here's this repressive regime, which every once in a while lets up a little, seems to give a little, and then bonds her again to it. What happens to that ugly thing? What happens to that slave-holding regime? What happens to that ex exploitation and bludgeoning? Well, called the marriage. Well, you can look high and low. Where is Helen's marriage? When she leaves it, it no longer exists. It isn't anywhere. It isn't anything without Helen. It has to have Helen. It takes two to do a marriage. It takes two to do a battering marriage. It takes two to do war. It takes the attacker and the resistor. You have got to have somebody resisting to have war. That's why what we resist persists is because we are participating in keeping the war going. If there wasn't anybody there, I mean, there is no attack when there is nothing to hit. There is no battering marriage when you've not got a battering, a battery. <laughs> now, what is it? What, what are the similarities between Helen and all the rest of us? Every single thing I said is similar. This system tells us, well, I mean, the United States of America government says in effect all the time to women, well, you know, we may not be perfect, but we're, but we're trying very hard. And um, you might not like us, but we're the best there is. I mean, any other place, boy, come on, you want to go to Russia? You think that guy's going to treat you any better than we do? Boy, you just ought to be lucky you got us. And it never occurs to us to ask, but who said we needed a husband at all? I mean, we don't need one at all, do we? But we think we need one, and this one is the best one we can get, so we might as well stick with Fred, because he said George is going to be worse, and we know George is just about practically killing Ruth, so I'll stick with George. Never asking, who said we had to have one at all? One day, that's what Helen asked herself, hey, why did I think I had to have this husband, any husband? Why did I think I had to choose and try to get the worst, what, the lesser of the evils? So, also, let's see, what are the other, <coughs> the other, um, similarities or this other same things about that relationship with Fred and, and our battering husband, the patriarchal state. We think that we have to change this. We think we have got to deal with this marriage. We think we've got to get those guys to change. We think that we've got to get the laws changed. We've got to work with these men. We think there is no alternative. And what I know is that the minute we think there is no alternative, we have just run up against our conditioning, our brainwashing, because there are always alternatives, always alternatives. And any time we think there isn't, we know we have just run up against that massive brainwashing. Just like that bad woman who thinks she has to keep dealing with this. Women who say to me, but we've got to deal with this system. That's what we've got. I say, can you hear that battered woman's voice? Why do we have to keep dealing with Fred? Why do we have to keep worrying about his, his tyrannical regime? Why do we have to worry about we can only take the car to, to see Mother on Saturday? I mean, why do we think we have to get him to change that? Why the hell won't we just take the car and go see Mother? Why don't we, I mean... Why do we think we've got to get him to decide what we can do? Why do we think we even have to deal with him? Why do we even, th why do we even think we've got to stay married at all? Why? Because, you see, we really don't believe we can do it ourselves. 
because we still are colonized people, because we don't see that right in the middle of patriarchy, it dying away there, we can and must and will and are building the new world at this moment. And when I mean say build, I'm not just talking metaphysically, I mean really objectively building it. That we can, in fact, and must simply make a new world. We must, as communities of women, it seems to me, figure out how we wanted the world down the, down the road somewhere and decide to have it now. And that's part of the revolution, deciding that we deserve it now for ourselves that we deserve to have the world just the way we want and need it right now and that we are the only ones that can make it that way for us and that evidence of our loving ourselves is that we will give it to ourselves. We will make it for ourselves and that we can tell how much our revolution is going on, our revolution of loving ourselves, taking ourselves seriously, believing in ourselves, trusting our own voices, which is the revolution. We will be able to see how fast and how well that is going by, whether or not we are willing and believe in ourselves and one another enough to begin simply doing it right now the way we wanted it. If you don't want to send your kids to school, and it's immoral to send children to school. <laughs> if you wanted a world in which you didn't have to send children to school to get murdered and massacred and have things happen to them that you can never undo, if you want that world, then tomorrow, stop sending your children to school. Start deciding what you're going to do instead. We have got to begin taking responsibility to make it the way we want it, the way it's necessary for this species to come home to. We've got to make a world in which women can mother our children. Because patriarchy, the most, in, the most incredibly, the anguish of patriarchy to me has been that I have had four children and haven't been able to mother them. That I have only been able to give birth to them. And then they put me in a straitjacket and they put fetters on my feet and stuff to gag in my mouth. And then I had to turn them over to the fathers, T, capital T, capital F, and stand and watch why they tortured them and murdered them and hurt them and hurt them and hurt them and hurt them. And I am damn near dying of that. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to have a world in which this happens to children. It's immoral. And I'm at the place where now I know that to have integrity, I have got not to participate in immorality. I've got not to say, well, we can't help it. That's the way the guys are. I've got to say, well, so care. who cares what they're doing? We can do it the way we want it. We can make a world and must make a world and must stop bringing children into a world if we're not willing to take the responsibility of making that world a world in which women can mother our children, can make it full of joy and laughter and happiness and good feeling about oneself in a place where people just learn and learn and learn and can't get stopped and not send them to school to stop them learning and growing and living joyously. We have got to make that world and can, can easily. So much easier than suffering, watching those kids go off to school and then trying to put them together in two or three hours at night and can't do it and send them off again. Oh, damn. I would much rather, it doesn't seem like there's anything worth doing other than just making it. Getting together as a community and deciding, hey, what kind of world do we need for ourselves right now and our children? What do we need? What do we want? Let's figure out how we can have it now. Now, there's something, because you see, if we can be joyful now, right now, we are making a world in which women are joyful, because how we do it is what we get, and patriarchy cannot sustain women's joy. If we want that world, then right now we begin to live in it, this minute, and it makes it come about. And the only thing that makes it difficult for me to do that is my Puritan upbringing, and everybody in this country, Jew, Catholic, Mormon, has a Puritan upbringing. Because what we believe is, this is American to believe, we are deeply programmed to believe that we are not making change, we are not making any difference in the world unless we're suffering. 
that the degree to which we're suffering is the degree to which we're changing things, right? And so, oh boy, we talk about struggle. It's a struggle, but I'm willing, you know, and, and, and we're burning out and we're, our immune systems are going kaput, but you know, we know that we're getting somewhere because we're really suffering a lot, aren't we? And it makes us feel really good about ourselves because we figure that's making change even though we can't see any, it's only getting worse actually around us, but we don't want to look at that because it makes us feel so good to suffer because we think we're changing things when we do. So the hard thing is to feel good about yourself when you're not suffering and to really believe that non-suffering makes a non-suffering world and that for all we do by suffering is make a world in which women suffer. It's hard to make that leap inside. I can do it in my head, but, and then, of course, all, all outside me, people want to make that a hard leap for me to make, too. They say, Sonia, obviously you don't care about women. I mean, women are out there suffering, you know. I mean, while you're sitting, feeling joyful, feeling free. <laughs> Feeling free, feeling terrific, feeling powerful. Well, you're not living in patriarchy a whole hell of a lot of women are. Fat lot you care about them. So what about that woman out there with seven children, no, 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 no money, suffering, no job? You know, what about that woman? Hmm? So you're just going to stop, are you? You're just not going to care about her. And I say, you know, the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing is because I do care about her. Because the screams of the women of this world, I cannot bear them any longer. If I don't do something that finally begins to make a difference in those lives, I'm not interested in anything else. That's what I'm interested in. And everything I was doing and everything I've seen us doing has only been making it worse. And I'm not willing to, have a, to ha make my conscience feel terrific by continuing that old way and have people approve of me for doing what they think makes change and makes them feel good and have that woman keep on screaming only louder and louder and more women join her and by the year 2000 the entire poverty population of this country be women and our kids and more women be killed every day and more raped and more battered. I don't, I don't care if I'm a, a mite uncomfortable doing this thing because what I think is if enough of us live in a non-patriarchal world moment by moment and as I stand here before you, the gift you give me is that while I give this speech, I don't live in patriarchy. For a whole hour and something, I live in no patriarchy. I feel so free, so powerful, so connected to you, so able for us to do anything. I live in a, the world I dreamed I was going to get down the road somewhere. I live in it up here. If enough of us can do that moment by moment, live unafraid, live feeling free, feeling joyful, feeling loving of ourselves, powerful to change and make the world the way we need it. Just enough of us, moment by moment, we make that a possibility on this planet. We put it into the collective unconscious. We make a new pathway in the brain. We change the morphogenetic field. We change the hologram. However you want to look at it, we make an alternative possible. We make it happen. We make it come to be real. If we can do it right now, enough of us, just the critical mass of us, not, all, not even all feminists, not even all radical feminists, just enough of us feel that way, live that way, we make it possible for women all over the world to move quickly to that place. Enough of us get through this maze, get through that, those feelings of doing everything in relation to men, fearful of men, worrying about men, taking care of men's diseases, not letting them grow up and do it themselves. Enough of us live in a world where we are important, where women are central because we are women. That's the revel. That's the transformation of planet Earth. That's what will change it, and that's what will change it overnight. I don't mean down the road somewhere. I mean overnight. I've done this in my family, and I've watched it happen overnight. And what I'm saying in recovery language is if we stop enabling the men to do evil, if enough of us stop it, the behavior changes very quickly. I must tell you one last thing about how I stopped at my family overnight. I came to my third teenager. I thought I would die. <laughs> I thought I cannot stand another adolescence. And I had one more to go after him. And I just wanted to be lifted up by the uh, extraterrestrials and taken off to wherever they take people <laughs> and never be put back. One night, this third 
teenager of mine, we were up in the kitchen going at it tooth and tongue, and he went charging down to his room in fury and slammed the door and the whole house rocked. And I was standing in the kitchen, just left there, you know, oh, oh, not knowing what to do. I had no idea what to do with a teenager. I still didn't. The third time around, I hadn't learned a thing. I was still doing all the wrong things. I was still doing this. I was still... Finally, I just got so full of rage. Rage is the first evidence of health returning, <laughs> of life coming back. I was so full of rage at what had happened to me as a mother on this planet, that in incredible indignity and slavery of motherhood in patriarchy. I was so full of fury at that that I said to myself, that kid can go to hell in a handbasket. I would be sorry because I love him and I'm not going to put any energy in to stop loving him. But I'm not going to keep holding his heel over the abyss. Because while I'm holding his heel over the abyss, I can't get on with my life for one thing. And for another thing, all my internal climate, my, well, my feelings of well-being are dependent upon what he's doing hanging down over that cliff while I got a hold of his heel. I'm making my whole, I'm putting, I'm giving him responsibility I'm making my feelings of security and happiness dependent on that kid's behavior, that teenager's behavior. Wow, is that dangerous or isn't that dangerous? <laughs> and that's the very thing we do with patriarchy. We have made our happiness dependent upon whether or not Bork gets on the Supreme Court. We have made our feelings of safety, security, well-being dependent on the behavior of a bunch of children, not children, um, children are nice. Um, men. Um, men. <laughs> Infant, infantile is a word I want to say, and we have helped infantilize them. We were, we're all involved in this, but we have made, put, made them, we've made our happiness dependent upon their behavior. My word, we have put in their hands the power to kill us to make us miserable every minute of our lives, to scare the wits out of us day and night, to keep us totally in their power. And that's what I noticed in my own kitchen with my own son. And I said, forget that. Boy, I am going to take back that. Re I'm going to now make my internal climate and my well-being, my feelings of safety and joy and success and happiness dependent on, on me, on my behavior on me alone because I'm the only person I can control in the whole world. I can't change that kid's behavior. I can't make him do anything. And while I've got his heel over the abyss, I keep trying to make him do this, make him do that so that I won't die. I've got to be the one whose behavior decides how I feel. And if that kid's self-destruct decides to catapult down into that, that abyss, then I would be sorry, but it can't destroy my life because I'm going to take it back. I'm going to make it dependent on me. Now, I wasn't totally clear about this, what was going on in my mind. It wasn't in my mind. I usually do things and I look back several months later and say, oh, that's what happened there. But that's what happened there. I went down to his room. I knocked on his door. He opened it very reluctantly. We had been fighting about the door being open or closed in his room. <laughs> and. Um, I don't think I said anything to him I hadn't said before. It wasn't what I said. It wasn't what I did. I'm sure I just said the same old thing, such as I'm going to take this door off its hinges. You will never have a door on this room. And so on, you know, same old threats. It wasn't that my behavior changed. It was that I had changed. I was now somebody else. And the minute he opened the door, he knew that it was all over. <laughs> And it wasn't what I said, it was who I was standing there. We were who we are all around us all the time. If some other woman walked up onto this, this stage and stood here by me, you would tell, you could tell, I don't know if it's her aura or what it is, but you could tell how she felt about herself. We tell people if we feel powerful. We tell people if they can control us. We tell people if we're dependent on their opinion to feel good about ourselves. We tell them by the way we just stand there and be. We shout this out. Well, I did a lot of shouting to him, I guess, because overnight that kid decided not to self-destruct. He knew, not on his head, but on his viscera somewhere, he knew that it was up to him. Mama had let go of his heel. She was now back in her own life, in her own body. He was going to have to take care of his. And I mean overnight. I'm not speaking metaphorically. 
I'm speaking actually night, like night and, day, night and day. Between the night of October 16th and the morning of October 17th, that kid's life turned around in such a dramatic way, I can't describe it. What I've been trying to get to happen in that house of teenagers for about 15 years happened overnight. I didn't even know what I'd done. But boy, believe me, I went with it. <laughs> God, if this does this, and it lasted. And everything changed in that house. My relations with all the kids, all the, everything, that whole house changed. And the reason is that I changed how I felt about myself in that situation. I realized I couldn't change anybody else. I can't control anybody else, and I can't let anybody else. I can't put that responsibility for my happiness on anybody else, or I am going to live, have excruciating experiences one after another and be in slavery forever. And when I did that, it was all of everything has to change to accommodate our new way of being in the world. When enough of us do this, enough of us live in this new place, men cannot be in that old place. We have to be in that, we have to be collaborating in it for it to happen. It takes two to patriarchy. I'm leaving, I've left in effect, and while I'm up here, I'm gone. Um, and what, I, and as I say, thanks for giving me the chance to do it, because it feels so great. And so I'm thinking that at the end of this speech, what, to just kind of reinforce our feelings of competence to do this job, our feeling that it's our destiny to do it, we therefore can do it, that we can do it independently, that we are free to do it any time we decide we are free, we are free. Any time we feel free, we will then begin to act free. We don't need to worry about what to do. All we've got to do is decide how we want it to feel in a new world and start feeling that right now, and out of those feelings will come behavior we could not begin to imagine will begin to come the new world. We will just do it. We will just simply do it together. So the revolution is loving ourselves so passionately, so completely, looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, Sonia, I love you. I really, really love you. You are so beautiful. What did you do, practice all night? <laughs> Look at you, and so smart, and you know, I am your best friend. I will never betray you again. I will never compromise you. I will never do things that will tell you that I don't love you, like voting for some man just because he's right on some other issues but doesn't care a shoot about you. I will never, ever give you that message that you don't count, that everything else counts but not you. I will never do that again. You can count on me to be with you and be your best friend. I respect and honor you. You can count on me to do that forever. And then, when we can do that with ourselves, we don't have to worry about trusting and loving other women, not trashing them, not betraying them. The reason we do it is because we betray ourselves, because we project our self-disgust, our self-hatred upon one another. People who love themselves don't go around tearing anybody else down. They allow diversity. They don't have to talk about allowing diversity all the time. They simply do it because they feel so secure in themselves, because they so love themselves. They're so, they've got such a good friend here who will never leave them, never betray them. They are then free of all those other, other necessity to project and hurt out of self-hatred. That's the revolution. When we do that, it's all over for patriarchy. So to sing the song about doing that, you know, when I talk about loving women, I just want to make this one thing clear before we sing the song. I'm not just talking sexually, but I want you to know that that's all right with me too and that I do it. I'm talking about <laughs> deeply honoring and respecting ourselves, so much so that we cannot participate in things that are not honorable to us, are respectful of us, that we simply cannot do them because we love ourselves so much. So let's sing a song about loving ourselves. Let's sing to the tune of your general angry people, three verses. First one, we are strong, <clears throat> strong, courageous women. Second one, we are changing the world together. That takes a little fiddling with the rhythm, but I'll sing loud. It's easy anyway. You can get it. <laughs> and we're changing the world by changing ourselves. When we change us, everything has got to change. It all depends on us. 
And the last verse, the most revolutionary verse of any song ever sung by any group, any time, ever. And that is, we are women loving women. Okay, everybody up and put your arms around each other. Put your arms around each other when you do this. Up, 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 up. We are strong, courageous women. And we are singing, singing for us.